Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm doing five small box reviews, or in the case of some of these, uh, box might be a loose term here, but five small game reviews over here. We're going to go through each of these, and one of these is sticking around in my collection for right now. We'll see how long it lasts. The other four are all okay, but I'm moving on from them. Most of these did a decent job of entertain me, entertaining me, but most of these I also don't feel the need to hold on to. But with that, let's go ahead and dive into this, starting off with the first one, which is Barnyard. Barnyard is a wallet-sized game. It is not from Buttonshy. It's instead from, I should know this, from BoardGameByFolds.com. Uh, that's a little BoardGameByFolds.com. But basically over here, what you're going to have with Barnyard is you're going to have a bunch of cards. Let's take the rules out over here. Let's put these in play. You have your farmers, which you don't have to use them, but they do give you a bit of an asymmetric reason why you want them. And then from there past that, you're going to create a little bit of a card row. So you're going to create a card row. Let's switch these around over here. This is what you're going to be playing. It's a two-player game. You're going to have these cards in play. And then from there, you'll have these cards down here. Now on your turn, you're going to use one of these abilities to manipulate the cards over here and then select the card at the front of the line. So for example, over here, let's just zoom in over there. You can go ahead and swap any two. And let's say we really want this pig over here because it's one point per pig and we want that. And then we're going to go ahead and grab that. And perfect. Now we're going to grab this pig, put it into our board. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a three by three grid. So over the course of the game, you're going to slowly grab cards. New cards are coming out. Players are going to be using abilities. This will come into play. And so you slowly have two abilities to manipulate the market and then slowly putting cards into your row in different ways. From there, you're going to look at the cards you have once you're all done. Once you have a 3x3 three three grid, which you've taken time to actually go through as opposed to the way I just did it, you're going to look to see how they all score. Everyone has slightly different ways that they score, so this one has one point per, per uh, hay bale that's going to be in these four positions. Now, since I rapidly distributed here, I haven't done a lot of thought as far as why my grid is the way it is, but you're going to look over there, one point per, you know, one of these uh, yarn needles on these four corners. Had I slightly changed the way, even had I some done... Even if we just done this like this, this would already be a much better scoring game because I'd be scoring these two and then these two over here. And then if I put these two over here, it'd be even better. But obviously, I'm doing this with the benefit of hindsight. As you play through the game, you'd be trying to manipulate the cards to score as many points as possible. Take into account the, uh, this, the starting farmer that you have, and that's basically your score. It's okay. It does the job. It has some degree of drafting. I find the manipulation engine of how you rearrange the cards to not be that satisfying. And then the farmer gives you an additional little bit of asymmetric thing. It's a fine game, it does the job, but I've played much better in this small, wallet-sized game that gives you a compelling puzzle. It, I, I've said it twice now, but I'll say it again. Barnyard does the job. It is entertaining, it is not inspiring. Moving on from there, we have, and I'll say as far as rating goes, 3 out of 5. It was totally okay, I enjoyed my plays of it, and I don't need to play it again. Moving on from there, we have Splitter. Splitter is going to be coming to you from Pandasaurus Games, and this one is a roll and write. A roll and write, you can play multiple players, you can play it solo. There's two different boards as far as different ways you can play through it. But in Splitter, let's take the basic board over here. In Splitter, you're going to have your rolling dice, and you have to go ahead and split the dice. So for example, these five and this four, I'm going to go ahead and put this five over here and this four over here. We're going to roll it again. You might not be able to see it that well, and I understand that. It's the nature of rolling rights in this. I'm going to put the four over here and the two over here. Now, what you have to do is when you put the dice down, you have to mirror how far away they are from the line. So you can't simply put them anywhere. You don't have to connect to things already on the board, but you do have to mirror things. I have a five and a two. Hmm. Let's go ahead and put the five over here, which is probably an inefficient play. I'm going to put the two over here. That was probably really bad over there. But the general idea of what you're trying to do is you're trying to create groups of exactly that number and that size. So for example, right now, a group of two would only score if it was two twos. So if we keep scoring over here, let's go ahead and roll that. Let's put the two over here and the four over here. So right now, this four is on the way to scoring because there's three of them. And this two can score unless I put another two next to it. If it's a group of three twos, that violates the principle. You only score it if it's exactly that size not smaller, not larger. The tricky part is as you roll dice, you're constantly dealing with the fact that you have to try to mirror what position is good for both numbers on both sides. So for example, I think I'm going to dump this six over here where it has lots of room to grow and put the four over here where I've now closed off that section of four. The more you play through it, the more you have to make interesting decisions. So for instance, right now, I'll put that five down here and then, ooh, nope, nope, nope. That's the five over here and the two over here and erase that five. That was a mistake over here. But the general idea being that I now have a three of my fives and this two over here is already done, assuming I don't put any more twos next to it. We need some more sixes, so we'll go ahead and toss a six down here and a one down here. One score, as you might imagine, on their own. And then a four and a three. We don't want the fours to, to be grown against because we already have that four. So I'll toss the three down here and the four down here and see how that goes. And you keep doing this over here like you can see. So the six 
six and the one. I'm going to pop the six. Uh, let's go ahead and pop the six over here and the one down here. If those ones touch, they won't score points. And you do that until the grid is full. Compare your scores against the other players or against the solo sheet as far as, you know, uh, scores to beat. And that's basically the game. You have this grid as well to go through if you want a slightly different uh, puzzle to go through. And that is Splitter. Roll dice, split your dice against the mirror, and try to score as efficiently as possible. It's fine. It's definitely different as far as the puzzle you have compared to, you know, many other Roll and Write games. But it also gets fairly... What you what you see in the game is what you get, and you get it gets fairly samey after a few plays. You do not need the number of sheets this game comes with because the game will become repetitive after your fourth or fifth play without a ton of variety as far as how you engage this. Again, it does a job. It's fine, but in a world of amazing and excellent roll and rights, Splitter is just fine. Another 3 out of 5. Many of these, for the record, are 3 out of 5s. All of these games are... This one... This one is debatable. Let's talk about Regroup Chicken Army. And I say debatable as far as a 3 out of 5. This one might be a 2.5 out of 5, but but I'm not sure because it's... It's got a lot of charm, but it also has too many issues. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this one's a 2.5 out of 5, although I want this one to be higher. Because the charm is there. The The game is cool. The the little puzzle of overlaying cards and combat that you have with other players is fun to go through. But it, it just ends too quickly. The whole game ends too quickly. I've played this a few times now, and it just constantly feels like the game's over just as you're starting to get into it. So in this game, you're basically going to have your initiative card, you're going to have your own little scoring thing which gives you your, your player score over here. So for example, my, this player's health is 30 because whatever the arrow points, that's what your health is. So that number over there is 30. I know it looks like a 3 with a little skull in it. That's their 30. It's not the best, but it does the job. That's not my complaint here. You also have your starting cards, which are going to have these little skull icons in the middle. Let's put these off to the side. And then you have the other player with their 30. And then you have, let's put these off. And by by the way, the art here, the art is adorable. Like, look at these characters. Look at these characters as far as the charm and the art of who they are and everything and all that. But that is not, you know, does not make a game over there. Past that, you'll have your center cards over here, which you'll shuffle up. You'll lay them out. And then we'll go ahead and put these out. And so we have one, two, and three. Now, players have access to basically getting the first card or the face-down top card at any point. So I can take either of these cards, no problem at all. In order to take these cards, I need coins. And if you're like, there are no coins, well, there are coins in the cards. We'll talk more about that. So I'm currently the one with the initiative. So I'll take a card. I'll take this one because that'll give me a coin for the future. And then I have to overlay it in some way. You must overlay it. You do not have a choice. I'm going to pop it down there to get these symbols next to each other. These cards will slide down, the other player will go ahead and pick, and they're going to pick, they want that two coin one, that's going to give them a lot of flexibility, and right now I have no defense, and the, they have to decide whether to go offensive or defensive, but right now, that is going to, they have over here, that was their, let's give them this, this starting card over here, let's go ahead and pop this down over here, which is possibly the wrong move, I don't know, let's, let's put it down over here like this and see what happens. So effectively what happens right now is, we now go ahead and weigh up the options. I have two magical attack, they have two magical defense. There are basically a few different symbols, there's physical defense, physical attack, magical attack, magical defense, coins, and potions. Those are the symbols you have. Now the problem is you only count things if they are adjacent to other things, which means none of these count except for these and these, although the potions and coins do count, but that we're going to come to later. So two versus two, nothing happens, no scores get modified. We go to next round, we're going to go ahead and pass this over here, and this can be played multiple players or as a head-to-head. -head. Right now I have it set up as a two-player experience, and so over here from there, now this player goes first. Now they can buy either of these cards, they need one coin to access this card. They don't have to spend it, they just have to have it, and they need two coins to access this part. So by keeping this in play, they can always access any of the cards right now, which is very helpful, because they currently have the magical defense all set up and ready to go, but if they can line up that magical attack, and I think they're going to go ahead and try to do so, that potion is helpful for restoring your health every round, but then again, they can get a lot of physical attack going right now, and there's not a lot of shields out, so they can actually probably get a leg up on me if they line up some physical attack over there. They'll overlay, hmm, let's go ahead and put it down like this. Let's cover that magic attack. We're not doing anyone any favors. And right now we have our physical attack lined up. These cards slide down. I don't even have the axis of getting, oh, that would have been a good card. But I don't even have the axis of getting that card. So I'll go ahead and try to get, do I lean heavily into the magic attack? I don't really know. Or do I, because there is more magic attack on the table. You know what? I want the potions. I want the potions because I'm going to need to heal myself over here. They are going to get some attacks in. Let's get this card, which will give us some early potions. I could because of the coin. And let's pop this down somewhere where I can lean into my magical attack a bit more. And let's get it down over ah, the physical defense. I want the physical defense. So many options here. If we put it down over here... You know what? Let's go ahead and do this. We're going to pop it down over here and see what happens. So now the cards come out. This plays out. And we go ahead and weigh things up. 
I have three magical attack against their two magical defense. They will go down one health. They have three, because there's two chickens there, they have three physical defense against no shields. These don't count because they're not touching other shields. And that means I lose three health. But the good news is that then the battle, I have two potions. So I'm going to go back up to 29 over there. So things are looking good. We're going to go back, initial pass again. And now we're back to, again, the puzzle over here. Where they have physical, I don't have, this won't help me at all. One of these cards that will help me. The physical defense is not bad. You know what, let's go ahead and line up some physical defense because that's that might help me stay a bit more in play. Can I even use it well? Let's find out. So we're going to grab this physical defense card. I need it touching this over here for it to be relevant, which means it needs to be there or there, which is not the bestest, unfortunately. I could put it down over here. Nope, it won't help either. What if I did like this? I could do it like this. So I can give up a potion and a coin. I might do that, but that gives me a nice chain. Oh my gosh, and I think I even had an extra physical magical attack because I have two people there. Okay, great, that's my turn. This will slide down. He still has perfect options as far as choosing. He might choose to cover up. Right now I have a whole bunch of magical attack. If he can go ahead, you know what? He's going to do this. He's going to take this card over here and overlay his coins. So he's going to have less choice next round, although he still has that one coin. But now we're going to go ahead and weigh things up. I have one, two, three, four, five, six against four. He's going to take two damage from my magical attacks, and I have no physical attacks. And then he's going to do a one, two, three, four, five, six against my three. And I'll take three, one, two, three. And then we'll go ahead and um, I'll gain one health back. That is basically the game. It's a fun little compelling engine of overlaying cards as you go through it. I find that most of the time, this time I actually played it, it happens to be I played it much more defensively than we usually do, which might negate my score to a degree, but most of the time I find this game charges through to an ending fairly quickly. Just as you're getting your cards up and running, just as you have your engine going, you slowly reduce yourself down to zero. I find it does lean a bit more aggressive than it does defensive, and to that end, I find that it ends quicker than I'd like. It's fun, it's quick, it's good for, you know, small, well, the, the cards can grow a bit, but again, the game doesn't last that long. It's an enjoyable little puzzle with great art, with great little theme and charm to it. My biggest complaint is that I find it leans more into the attacking than the defending to the extent that I find most games end just as it's kind of getting interesting. Not a lot going on, it does have charm, but I wish it lasted a little longer or had a drop more complexity. Uh, 2.5, I want to like it more than I actually do. It really is charm. The chickens are adorable. I mean, this company, by the way, uh, Draco Studios, not Draco Studios, they, um, Detestable Games, or maybe both, they have a bunch of games in this line, and they are all very charming. I have not played most of them yet. With that, let's go ahead to Longboard, designed by Reina Knizia and put up by 25th Century Games. And Longboard is a game about building your longest or your best longbirds, as you can imagine. This game, and let's see if we can try to give you the cars and the general idea as you go through this, but the basic idea of the game is you're trying to build the best longboards, so going to score the most points. You're going to have a few goal cards in place. So let's go ahead and put some goals into play. And these are going to be goals you have, so use no wilds on any board. That would give you a bunch of points there. Green board with the most cards, the fewest stickers on a board, and board with all values one through eight. Those are going to be the goals from a host of goals you can play and play. These beach cards are to give you a bit of clarity on the where you're starting your longboard. Let's put those off to the side right now. Past that, what players are going to be doing over here is they're going to be drawing cards in order to build the best best longboard in the game. Players are going to start with a few longboard cards in their supply, and these may not have been shuffled properly since the last game, so excuse them if they are all exactly the same color. Let's go ahead and shuffle it since the last game, because that, that was not the best drawing over here. So we're going to go ahead and distribute two cards to each player. Let's just do this, this, and this, and get rid of the previous cards on the table. Again, apologies for not shuffling, so I have all the cards sorted based on the boards we built. Players are going to have these cards in play, and they're not yet built. You, you have cards in your supply, but you could choose to start building them. But the general idea is on your turn, you're either going to be going ahead and drawing cards, or playing cards, or exchanging cards with other players. Effectively, you have two actions. You can use those actions to build a board. So, for example, I can say, I'm going to go ahead and start this board over here. That's where the beach cards come into play to indicate that you're starting a board officially. And then I'll maybe I go ahead and draw a card, and we add it to my supply. Now, cards are either in your supply, in the deck, or your boards you're starting to draw, the problem is you can steal you can steal boards from other players as you go through the game. So for example, I can take this 5 over here, and I can exchange it with this 4 because I really want this 4. Whenever you exchange cards, you have to exchange for one card, and the sum of values have to be greater than that card. So a 5 has to be greater than a 4. What you're trying to do is you're trying to build long boards, but whenever you build a long board, you have to have the same color, 
or a wild, and it has to be the same number or higher. That's why you have things like using no wilds on any board would score you three points, but maybe we don't care for that. Maybe we just want to go ahead and start. And you can't start with a wild, by the way, that has to go on top of the cards. The green board with the most cards can be very helpful. So what happens is, as you go through the game, you're going to have players drawing cards, and maybe we take these two cards, we put them in front of us, we have two fours over here. Again, those cards I didn't shuffle. Maybe it goes back to this player, he draws a card, he draws another card, he has a one and the eight. It goes back to this player over here, we have a one and a eight over here. And back to here, and then maybe on my turn, I go ahead and start building that one. And then over here later, I want to try to get my hands on a four, so maybe I trade that seven in for this four, and take that and put it out. And then maybe on a future turn, I take that eight and this four. By the way, I'm playing incredibly inefficiently, but I'm slowly building out a board that I can actually go ahead and let's pretend I draw more cards and I trade that seven in for this four because a whole bunch of fours getting that largest green board it's gonna be the green board with the most cards and I put a five down which means fours can no longer be played so you're trying to build towards the board and boards are, are worth points equal to the number of stickers on the board which do get hidden as you go through the game so at no point you are you fully clear exactly who's winning which is relevant because once you hit a certain number of boards you can actually go ahead and trigger end game if you choose to but only if you choose to and so the game comes down to a combination of drawing cards playing cards and trading cards with other players while trying to get as many stickers on the boards you're building and while trying to be mindful of the various goals in the various goals in play that will give you extra points that is basically it it's long board it's a bunch of cards and you're trying to draw them and i find it charming and fun and it does the job like i said a few times about other games in this video i've enjoyed my plays of long board but it doesn't stick with me it 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 gives you a few, you know, things to be mindful of, objectives and cards, and it's fun, but it's it's not a game that stands out in a universe full of amazing games to play. This was an okay experience that I had fun with, and I, I like going through it. It's fun to build out your boards. It's, I would say the thing I enjoyed the most is stealing cards from other players. That certainly gives you something to be mindful of or to think through as you try to think to, do you want to hold on to that card to play it onto your longboard? But if you hold on to it, someone might take it before you can use it. And so you are juggling things like that as you go through the game. But again, not enough going on. It's a lighter experience, but I would just say I can recommend other games that I think are more inspiring than what Longboard is. And then lastly, we have Downtown Farmer's Market, which to me is the favorite of the group. Although still, you know, not a perfect game, not by any means, but an enjoyable experience that is charming and easy to play and probably just the most fun, although I don't know how many... I don't know how many interesting decisions I'm making as I play through this. I'm enjoying my time with it, and I'm having fun. This is a game that actually has two versions of it. There's Farmer's Market and Lost Seas, depending on where you're playing this game. Like, if you go on Board Game Arena, you can play this game as Lost Seas. It's exactly the same. The only difference is whether you're dealing with, like, you know, tentacles and rocks on the islands as opposed to, you know eggs and carrots and cheese but effectively in this game you're going to give players various goals and then you're going to take those goals you're going to set them up i'm not going to heavily worry about this right now i'll just show you what it roughly looks like set up and then from there normally what you do is you have a bit more agency over those goals you'll get them and then you'll actually go through a thought process of how you want to build your grid or you can, if you're starting off for the first time just give players the goals give them a good mix of easy and hard and just have them have them start off the game. Again, once you play through it the first time, you're like, oh, that makes sense, and this is how I want to build my grid. But spending too much time thinking about how you want to do your goals before you've played this game, I think is uh, not worth it. Past that, you're going to go ahead and distribute these tiles over here, and we're going to distribute these tiles, let's put them above the grid over here. Let's actually move everything down a drop. So you're basically playing these tiles above the grid in a selection process that will vary slightly depending on the player count, but in general, you put down five tiles. I'll just run this as a two-player game for right now, and then we'll, we'll talk through things. But effectively on your turn you're going to go ahead in a two-player game you're going to draw one discard one when you play through this now this game i will note there's the way i there's the way the game is meant to be played and the way i tend to play it which is slightly different but that will factor into my uh, opinion of things the way the game, game is meant to be played is you draw and discard there's agency over denying others and then agency over what you're doing what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to fill out 16 tiles in this grid in a way that will score me as many points as possible by looking at the various goals so for example in this column i will score six points if i have eight symbols symbols total. Cards have between 1, 2, and 3 symbols, and I want 8 across 4 cards. So for example, a 3, 2, 2, and a 1 would accomplish that. That would be 8, because math. Over here in this column, I want 10, which is slightly harder, so it gives you an extra point for that. In this column, I get four points for every grouping of those three symbols, which means off the bat, this might be a good tile to start with because it'll already give me a few of those, so might that one. But then over here, I want to have the most milk, meaning in this column, I want more milk than anything else. In this column, in this row, one point per egg. In this row over here, nine points for having six of the same symbol. That means you need to lean into a specific symbol over there. Over this one, I get six points if I have two corn and one bread. And this one, I get one point per corn. So I'll go ahead and I'll grab this tile over here, because why not? Let's put it over... Hmm, 
I want the bread in this column. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and grab this one over here. We're going to pop this one down here. This should work nicely. It'll fulfill the bread over here on the corn over here. I'll still need one more corn in this row, but exactly one more corn. I cannot afford any more bread or corn. Well, I can afford one more corn. No more bread in this row. Then I'll go ahead and deny one of these tiles to another player. So let's pretend I look at that player's grid over there. I say, you really want... Milk. I don't know. You want milk. Fine. I'm going to go ahead and discard this tile and remove it from the game. Then another player will take a tile and discard a tile, and there'll be left one tile next for the next round, which is always, at any player count, that always go is going to be the case. Now, again, player count will slightly differ as of exactly the selection process, but generally there's a degree of selecting and discarding, and then one tile left over for each round. Now, the other player goes first this time. They'll go ahead and take this, and they'll discard this eggs because they know I want the eggs. They know that I do want the eggs. I did want the eggs. But I'll go ahead, nonetheless, and I'll put this one over here because at least I can start locking in milk and still get an egg. I do need some milk in this column after all. That's the basic idea of the game. You're slowly going to be filling out the grid by gathering various tiles, and it starts off all full of promise as you think through how you can get that perfect experience and that perfect game, and then slowly but surely you watch your dreams crash down around you. Not that dissimilar than Calico. If you played Calico, kind of the same feeling. You start off thinking, I can do everything, and then you go to the point where you're like, I did nothing because I shot too high and thought I can get everything done, and you can't in this game. Now, one thing I will say is when I play the game, I tend to teach it and play it with less of a denial game going on, meaning usually, let's say we're playing a three-player game, rather than setting up five tiles like you're supposed to, I'll set up four tiles, everyone picks one, there's one tile left over. In a two-player game, I alternate selection instead of doing a discard. Now, I do that because I find this game is... It's a fun, simple little puzzle to go through, and I enjoy it. I enjoy the little selection of trying to figure out how you can score points in this game, but I find it doesn't lean as well into the denial game. Like, it doesn't feel like a game that should have denial in it. I don't care enough about your puzzle. I'm not overthinking exactly what's going on. And yes, there are times in the game where I would say when I play, a th when I play through a full game of this with denial, I would think that of the, I don't know, 16 times, I don't know the exact number, but of the 16 times or so that I am thinking that I'm denying you a tile, two of them, I actually like really think there's meaning behind that. And the other 14 are kind of like, whatever, there's things you could take, there's things you can do. I put more thought into the denial than I care to, and so I kind of have just taken it out of the game as I play through it. So understand that I like this game, but I think the denial just doesn't play well in it, and so I've adjusted the way I engage with it to play through the point scoring optimization and just removing the denial entirely. But with that adjustment made, I, I like it. I find I find it is fun, it is simple. It's the same idea as Calico. If you like Calico, if you like that idea of grabbing tiles, of trying to perfectly score, it has that. I do have a few small complaints around it. One, I already fixed and adjusted. The other is that you pick various scoring goals when the game begins, and you have a choice between picking harder scoring goals or easier scoring goals. Now, the problem with that is that it kind of ultimately comes down to what comes out. Sometimes, if you go for the higher scoring goals and things work in your favor, you're just going to win. But it doesn't feel as, I guess, finely balanced as a game like Calico might be, where you're all playing with the same board and fighting for the same things to a degree. Uh, not exactly the same board. There are differences to the board in Calico, just for the two of you who are about to comment that. I know, but I mean the scoring goals and things. So I like the game. I enjoy it. I think I'd always choose Calico over it, but this is a little less brain burnery and it kind of operates in the same sphere. This one's easily my favorite of the group. It's still a 3.5. It's not like knocking out of the park, but I find that for the weight class, the teach, and the general play experience, it is, it's fun, it's simple, it's enjoyable, and it's sticking around, at least for now. In any case, those are five mini reviews. A quick summary again, uh, Farmer's Market, I enjoy this one, I, I find it compelling, simple, and engaging, and again, definitely on the simple side, but it's fun. Something about it is charming and fun and rewarding. Barnyard, I, is a, it's a decent game, but I have better games that focus on the whole pick and choose and scoring optimization. Also, the art doesn't draw me in either. Splitter is totally fine and enjoyable, and I've had fun with it, but in a world full of intricate roll and writes, this one is uh, play a few times and move on from it. Regroup Chicken Party, despite giving it the lowest score, has probably the most charm from all these games. The most charm, and the one I want to like the most. Like, I... I feel like a few small tweaks and changes, and this could be a game that I easily had in my collection. As it is, it's fun, it's okay, but uh, there's other games that do that overlay mechanic that are a little simpler, and, and, and it's fun. I want to like it more than I do. I want to. My issue with this is not the game or the charm or all that, it's just that it ends too quickly for what it's doing. And then lastly, Longboard is, is fine, does the job, but also... Um, it just does the job. And that is it. These are five simple, small mini-reviews. I hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and I hope you have a good one.